A lot of you know a little bit about cheetahs, but I'm going to tell you a lot more. The name cheetah, Asinonyx jubatus, stems from um, meaning a non-moving claw because the cheetah does not have a retractable claw like most cats do. It actually is a semi-retractable. It goes partially in. So the track of the cheetah always has a claw. And that claw has a very distinct purpose, which I'll tell you about in a minute. The second part of it means a mantle or a maned animal. And cubs are born with this mantle. In black and white, the cub re resemble a really nasty little uh, guy called the honey badger. Um, and the honey badger, most other animals don't want to mess with because they can be, for how tiny they are, they can be quite aggressive. So when the cubs are in the den and they look like the honey badger, there are a lot of animals that will just say, uh-uh, I'm not messing with that. And so we believe that that's an evolutionary element. Um, but it goes back a very long time because the Latin name um, is derived from that Asinonyx jubatus. The cheetah is the fastest mammal on land. And in doing so, does anyone know how fast a cheetah runs? 110 kilometers per hour or 70 miles per hour, which is about a quarter of the speed that you drive on the highways in California. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, 70 miles per hour, and they can achieve that in less than three seconds. The Ferrari car is the only thing that humans have created that can reach that speed in such a short time period. To do that, they have semi-retractable claws that act like running cleats. They have a very rough foot pad to the bottom so they can stop and go quickly. Their tail is actually flat on one side, so as the cheetah tries to move around, it acts like a rudder would in the water, and it helps them to make fast turns to be able to catch their prey. Their limbs are very loosely connected, so they don't just move their limbs forward and backward. They almost paddle when they run. Um, they have a flexible spine that acts like a spring, so that spring can bend like this and straighten all the way out like that as they run. And their stride is about 24 feet. This is about 24 feet here. Went full speed, one foot touches the ground at a time, and it takes 24 foot between, before that same foot touches the ground again. There are two points in a cheetah's stride where they're literally flying, and that's what's pictured in these two. No feet touching the ground whatsoever. And it's really quite amazing to see them when they're running at full speed. There's great National Geographic footage of that if anybody wants to check that out too. <clears throat> the cheetahs have a unique social structure. Unlike a lot of the big cats that live in, either they're completely solitary or they live in prides like lions. So the completely solitary ones are like leopards and tigers and things like that. The cheetah has a unique one in that the males will usually stay together and form what is called a coalition. And usually those coalitions are brothers, but not always. One of the coalitions that Elena is following in the Masai Mara has two brothers who the, she knows who the mother is, two brothers that they don't know who the mother or the father is, and then one younger one joined them, and they're a coalition of five, and in the Masai Mara they're called the Fast Five. So if you want to look up the Fast Five of the Masai Mara, you can follow Elena's story about that unique social structure, which is a part of our genetic studies as well. They have a very large home range, up to 3,000 square kilometers, and they can go down to a small one of about 23. Females will often have overlapping home ranges with each other. The males are a little bit more territorial, especially if they are, they're in a coalition, but the females are the ones who go out looking for the boys. So they travel over the long distances, and then after they have cubs, she's usually a single mother. She raises the cubs alone, but she has to keep moving with those cubs to keep them alive. And that's why she has such a large home range. They work, they're di diurnal hunters, so they hunt mostly in the morning and the evening, but they are adapting to human development, and I'll talk about that in just a minute as well, that they are doing a little bit more nighttime hunting. But the reason that they hunt better during the diurnal times is they have the same number of rods and cones in their eyes as what humans do. They can see in color, and they just don't see well at night. Their pupils react similar to what a human's does, and they can't see at night. Unlike the other predators, the, the cats that are like your domestic cat that the, that the pupil can grow really big and has a slit really tiny during the day, the cheetahs just don't, their pupil doesn't grow like that, that they can't see well at night. They are also very weak compared to the other predators. So in places where there are high lion and hyena populations, the cheetahs are quite often chased out of those protected areas and into the areas where humans are settling, around the buffer zones of the national parks and reserves. 
They can get their kill stolen from anything from a hyena and a lion down to jackals and vultures will quickly chase the cheetah away from their prey. So where there's high numbers of other predators, there's always low numbers of cheetahs. We decided to base ourselves in Kenya because Kenya is the second largest population of cheetahs in Africa. So the Eastern African population is connected to Tanzania. There's a small population in Uganda, a little bit up in the um, Sudans and Ethiopia. We know there's some in Somalia, but it's hard to get in there and do some of that studies in that area. And Kenya is the kind of the central point to all of those cheetahs. But cheetahs are declining at a rate of 2%, 2.1% annually. So we needed to be doing something in a place where there's a high amount of cheetahs. The Cheetah Conservation Fund was already based in Namibia, and that's where I went to learn about how to start the project and how to model the project off of what they were doing at CCF, and hence the reason that Lori Marker is a co-founder of our project, um, because she gave us some of the initial funding. When we first started working in Kenya, we weren't really sure how many cheetahs were there. There was a study that had been done where the researcher had sent out surveys to community groups and to rangers, and she had gone into a couple of the national parks and used it as a model to estimate that there was anywhere between 500, 500 and 1,500 cheetahs in Kenya. But she said there could be, based on this model, as much as 2,500. Um, we were able to conduct a national survey between 2004 and 2006, and we were able to determine there was indeed between 1,200 and 1,400 cheetahs at that time. So our study was a little more intense than what Paula Gross's study was, so it's hard to compare. And we are now starting, well, we started last year with our second national cheetah survey so that we can now get a little bit more detail and fill in some of the gaps. But we know that the threats to cheetahs are very similar to what they were at the time that Paula did her study. It's mainly human development, retaliation for... Um, retaliation for livestock losses, and now it's increasingly becoming pet trade as well, with most of those cheetah cubs going into the Middle East to the czar, or not to the czars and Caesars, that's the past, um, to, the, to, the, to the wealthy Arabs that are using them as pets and in sport. So, so that's a big part of what we're having to address now as well. Our National Cheetah Survey um, showed us some of the places that we needed to be able to set up projects. So in this particular thing, I think I have a handy little pointer here, our project, the Maramero Cheetah Project, is based here and is beginning to work in this area. Our Samburu base is up here. Our Salama and Athi Kapiti site is down here. There are three other projects that work in collaboration with the Kenya Wildlife Service um, that, that by, by the, the fact that they work with KWS, they work with us, but they're not under our program. And then we have two projects, this is Galana, this is Wajir, that we advise the, the rangers on how to collect the data and we analyze that data. Um, so we really have focused a lot of our efforts on these buffer zone areas around the areas where human development is happening the most quickly because of that land use change and infrastructure development that threatens cheetahs to the point that we know that we will never have cheetahs back in this zone again. And we don't want that to continue to spread in that way across the rest of Kenya. Elena has come up with a way to ID cheetahs, so using camera traps and what she's able to do. I get very jealous of Elena's study because she sees cheetahs every day in the Masai Mara. I'm really lucky if I actually get to see a cheetah every three to four months, but I get very happy when I find poop. I'll tell you more. Um, so the cheetahs from the time they're cubs, tourists can turn in their pictures to Elena. Um, she takes pictures on a regular basis. But from the time they're about two to three months of age, their spot pattern is exactly the same on their legs. If you take the stomach or you take the face as the cheetah grows, those, those spots will change a little bit. But what Elena found out is these spots on their legs never change. So her pedigree is based on these spot identification patterns. And she has been able to do a pedigree of almost 85% of the 160 cheetahs that she's identified between 2001 and 2017. Um, now she's added a couple more in the 2018. And the tail is another place that the pattern stays unique. When Elena did a project with the Kenya Wildlife Service, this was one of the first cheetahs that they named. I don't remember the name right now. Um, and then she collected cheetah pictures from some of the 
the tourists and the photographers of the Maasai Mara. So in 2008, this cheetah was in the Mara. And when Elena returned in 2011 to set up her project, the same cheetah was still there. Cheetahs, on average, live between 7 and 10 years old. And through these studies that Elena is doing, she's finding that males are in the Maasai Mara are living to about 9 years of age. And females are actually living up to about 13, which is really, really good because prior to 2007, when I first started to do some things in the Mara prior to her coming, they were telling us that adult cheetahs were just dying so quickly that they weren't able to reproduce themselves. So the fact that these ones in the Mara now are living a lot longer is a really good sign of the conservation efforts that they've been doing in the Mara, that the adults live long enough to reproduce more cat, cubs. So cubs are born about every two years. The babies will stay with the mother for just about two years before she can get pregnant again. So it means that if a female lives for five years, she maybe can raise two sets of cubs, but if she's living up to 13 years, she can potentially raise up to four sets of cubs. About 5% of the cubs that are born live to one year. So 95% of the cubs that are born die. And that is normal. It was discovered in the 1960s and the 1980s by all the researchers in the past that have looked at cheetahs. They have a very, very low cub survival rate. So it's very essential that these adults are surviving long enough to reproduce frequently and that that 5% of the cubs is often enough they can survive. Oops, I point the wrong way. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so land use change, like I said, is one of the biggest threats to cheetahs. I thought when I was setting up the project in Kenya, I was going to be dealing with farmers who were trying to kill cheetahs, and I was going to go do these great education programs and tell people don't kill cheetahs. Land use change is a lot harder of a thing to address than people killing cheetahs. You can change people's behavior, but you can't stop development. So there's no any you shouldn't want to. Development is essential for human rights as well. So what we've been trying to do is to find out how we can do sustainable development. Elena's focus in the Maasai Mara is giving us a lot of information about what cheetah behavior should be where they feel safe. The rest of our work on commercial ranches, subsistence farming, and pastoral communities means that we had to base ourselves in these different communities. So here again is just a kind of a repeat of what the threats to cheetah survival are. And in our own study area is one of the places where I've really seen it. When I first got into the Salama study area, there was a lot of open space, a few little ranches here and there. And what's been happening in development is the highway is being widened and growing a lot bigger and, and faster speed cars, but also a light rail is going in. And that light rail during the construction really cut off a lot of corridors for wildlife. But Luckily, the, the, peop, the, the developers of the light rail did think about where they would put corridors for livestock movement, for wildlife movement. Unfortunately, now people have realized that if they settle closer to where these corridors across the railway are, they can get their cattle back and forth to grazing areas quicker. So now what we're actually fighting is local development saying you've got to enforce no settlement in corridor because an elephant can't go through there if there's a ton of people that are settled right in the corridor. You're going to have conflict. One of the members of parliament that I'm friends with says if you build your house in the middle of a highway, you're going to get hit by a bus. So the same thing, if you build your house where the elephants have a corridor, where the cheetahs have a corridor, eventually you're going to have, not eventually, quickly, you're going to have conflict. So it's that same kind of theory. And how do you educate people to say, is it really worth it to be living right there where the animals pass and you know you're going to have conflict. And what, is, what are the alternatives to that? How can you develop an area but still use the corridor alongside of the wildlife? So that's a big part of what we're doing. To give you another shot, um, this is using, not satellite images, this is using GPS images from our first study. And these areas through here are where human development has been quite intense, the largest towns and cities of Kenya. And it goes across, this is kind of our agricultural belt of Kenya is what it is. And this population in the Maasai Mara and our population up in Laikipia and Samburu, there used to be a corridor right through here. And that corridor no longer exists. So right now, the only main corridor for cheetah movement is across this bottom part right here. If we can't maintain that corridor, at some point, we're going to have to start thinking about physically moving cheetahs from northern and southern Kenya to make sure that the genetics can be achieved with each other. Um, so again, this is a case, livestock farmers, the traditional cattle farming, 
that was, was the most important part of Kenya in the past has switched to small stock farming because having a lot of goats and sheep, they, get, they grow up faster. You can, you can eat the meat within a couple of years instead of four to five years. They don't require as much water, so it was really pushed on people that it's much easier to main goats and sheep. They keep their cows more for cultural value, and their goats and their sheep are what they make their money off of. So in the past, the cheetahs weren't a problem for the, the pastoralists who had cattle because cheetahs don't kill cows. They might kill an occasional calf. So our human wildlife conflict element has really grown and grown so fast just in the last 10 years because of the type of livestock keeping that people are doing. So the cheetahs are also having to adapt to the human livestock and, and livelihood developments that are happening. We didn't think cheetahs liked to swim. I don't think they still like to. But these are actually, again, lucky Elena. She gets to get the pictures. And I just have the satellite image of the, of the radio collars moving across the rivers. But these are pictures in the Maasai Mara of cheetahs that are swimming across the Mara River between Serengeti and Tanz at, between Tanzania and Kenya. And my radio collars up in Samburu showed that the cheetahs are swimming across the Owasso River the same way. So we're now saying, you know, they didn't used to have to do that because they didn't have to move so frequently across those rivers. So cheetahs are swimming more. Also, this hunting at night. The cheetahs don't see well at night. They don't see the other predators. They don't see humans coming to try to steal the, the meat away from them. So when they hunt at night, they're at a high risk of them getting their, their, lives, their, their kills stolen more and them even being killed. But we know that these are adaptations that our cheetahs are making to high human development. <coughs> Sorry about that. We, we developed two research bases to be able to hit those types of land uses that people have. In our Salama base, we opened that in 2009, right after I became independent from CCF and formed Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. This was the first field base that we opened. We decided we were going to keep our field base very, lo very local and very approachable by the community members. We don't have electricity. We don't have running water. We sleep in tents so that people feel very comfortable coming to talk to us and so that we're living the same way that they do. The only thing I don't do, I keep bees, but I don't keep livestock. Um, so people feel really comfortable coming and sitting around the fire, charging their phones, and talking to us about the issues in this community. And again, I based myself in a location where there was openness around us. This area up here is called the Ulu Conservancy, and it's actually owned by just three different people who have houses on it. But on the other side of me is all that development that I showed you in the beginning. So we're kind of right on the edge of that as well. I have had cheetahs walk through our camp, which is really exciting when that happens. Um, this, this study site is based down in the southern half right in the middle, right after some highway development and the railway development started to happen, the government of Kenya decided we're going to build this information, communication, and technology center. They hived off 5,000 acres and put a big fence around it, and that is in the center of our property. This by itself would not be a problem, but now what's happened is all of this land has become subdivided into small single subsistence farming plots. These ranches are still commercial cattle ranching, and they, they all have some kind of a tourist venue on them. So it also gives us an opportunity to look at how the wildlife are dealing with this. What we're constantly fighting with is these areas that are right around here, which make a corridor up into some mountains where there's a lot of water, out into the plains area where during the rainy season, tons and tons of wildebeest and zebra come into this area, almost as much as what come into the Masai Mara. And this corridor through here is how all of the predators move and follow the wildlife that go up and down to find water. So what we're dealing with now, together with these commercial ranchers, are the subsistence farmers that are trying to settle right around the park, because it actually said in the time that this ICT was being developed that these will remain wildlife corridors. And so that's one of our big fights right now is to keep squatters from settling into this because once a squatter has settled for five years in a location, you can't kick them off. So as soon as we start to see development, these farmers over here and some of there's this is a commercial ranch down here, we kind of all get together and we try to get the people who are policing that to come and do their job and to, to make sure that these corridors stay open. Um, so again, I, I've spoken enough about this, the linear development in Salama. Um, I kind of had forgotten that I didn't take this slide out, but it's kind of a repeat of the same thing. Um, the ICT center has put up a giant fence. 
In the beginning of putting up that fence, they trapped over a thousand animals inside and they didn't have any water for those animals. So we also had to rally KWS and all of our neighbors to get in, get the animals out and provide water for those that were inside in the middle of a drought. Um, these animals would not have survived if the neighbors and myself hadn't been there to make a difference. The highway development, um, this is no longer 19. In the, the, the years from 2009 forward that I have been studying in this area, we have had 20 cheetahs hit by car. When we started there, there were only 29 adult cheetahs in that area. And now there are only five adult cheetahs in this area. So the numbers are declining, but they've stabilized at five adults for the last four years. Um, and they're constantly having babies. The babies just move out on a regular basis. So they are still reproducing. But, but again, this is more what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with people trapping or poaching or poisoning. We're dealing with them getting hit by cars, which is a government level problem that has to be addressed altogether. Our Samburu base has a little bit more of a happy story to it. Um, the Samburu base, this is our field base up there. Um, the local community members are from the Samburu tribe, which are pastoralists and who don't really want as much development, but as schools and hospitals and road infrastructure is being developed, it is developing faster than even what most of the Samburu realize. And typically, when goats and, cow, or goats and sheep would be killed by, by predators, the, the people would, would try to hunt out and kill that predator. Developing a community conservancy began before I began working in here. I actually just rent a small piece for our camp from the community conservancy. And they've been trying to work with the community not to kill predators. One of the things happened last year, actually while I was here in the United States on my tour, one of our rangers received a call from two warriors that were really upset because rain was coming and they found baby cheetahs that were down in a, what we call a, a lugga, you guys will call it arroyos or washes, and they were afraid that those baby cheetahs were gonna drown. In the past, those warriors would not have cared. They just said, good, they're not gonna eat our livestock. But they called us. And that was for me the turning point that I knew that we were now really, really having an impact that they wanted us to save those cubs. My staff member said, you know, I don't think we need to move them. I don't think even if it rains, the water's not gonna get that high, it'll be fine. And the next morning he went there and this is what he saw. The mother was there with the babies. And that's what peaceful coexistence means, right? So our, our staff, they live and they work from their homes. Um, this is Lentum, who is our senior staff member in that area. They wear their traditional clothes while they go out and collect data, but they learn to use modern ways of collecting data so that we can use that to analyze and make science-based decisions. This is Moses, one of the other, key, one of the other staff members, talking to some of the ladies um, about how they use wood for um, their wood-burning stoves um, and, and what are the most sustainable ways to do that. So sustainable development is really a lot of what these guys are learning. And they learn to become leaders in their community. They don't live at my camp, they live at their homes. So they continue to interact with their, with their fellow community members every day as they learn about science and data collection. And I mean, we send them to public speaking classes, everything so that they can become the leaders in their community. Our goal is that they're not just collecting scientific data, they're sharing their information with other students that come in from other countries. Jimmy here is our oldest scout, and he loves to take students out because he loves to be able to tell them, I know more than you know when you're in school, right? Um, Lumumba, his strongest point is he loves to go and tell people how to build a better enclosure. So like if Jimmy has a problem with somebody who doesn't want to listen to him about building an enclosure, he calls Lumumba's from his area to come and talk to the guys. What are the steps you need to take to keep your livestock from getting hit, killed by the predators? And this is what they do every single day, is they go out, collect data, share data, and work within the community. Some of the conflict mitigation things that we've been testing are using a little bit of modern technology. This is a flashing light. How many of you have ever had a flashlight turned on in your face? None of you? Okay. And what happens to your, your sight when the light is shined on in your face? You can't see anything for a second. The same thing happens to a predator. When a bright light shines in their face, they go black. So if you've got your livestock inside of this enclosure and you've got a bright light shining and flashing, your eyes don't adjust to be able to see that prey inside of an enclosure and hunt at night. 
Okay, now cheetahs don't usually hunt at night. They don't go into bomas. But when we did interviews in the community, hyenas, leopards, and jackals were the number one conflict species, making people not like predators. So we started to address this because that was a way for us to gain trust in the community. We put up these lights, and we had these wires that ran across the top of the thorn bushes. And about six months later, the lights all stopped working. Five lights, six lights, everything down the line of the lights was stopping working. We realized that the sun was damaging the wire that we had across the top. We're going to be smarter than the sun. We buried the wires. Naked mole rats. Naked mole rats love to chew these wires. So we, again, we thought we're going to be smarter than the naked mole rat. We're going to put them in PVC pipes. Naked mole rats like those too. And then they like to bury into them as well. So I heard of, uh, through a friend of mine here in the States, I heard of someone who was in Australia who was using something called Fox Lights, and it was its own independent light that had a solar panel that shuts off when the sun comes up, turns on when the sun comes down. It has a series of these flashing lights that go all around in a circle, red lights, blue lights, white lights. Looks really pretty, but from a distance, it looks like there's people constantly moving around um, in the boma with flashlights, with cars, with motorcycles, and the predators don't like to come to the enclosure. When we had these lights up with the camera traps that we were using, we had 95% 95 per, 95 reduction in predators trying to come into the boma. When we put these lights up, we had 80% reduction in the predators trying to come to the boma. Now, the, the Samburu told me, mm -mm, we don't want 80%, we want this 90%, 95%. We don't want predators coming in our boma at all. So Michael, the friend of mine, I'll show you a picture of him in a minute. Um, Michael started developing using this technology and making these single lights that could go around the boma and didn't need to have wires for the naked mole rats to chew. What we found, because this was a, 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 a bought in the, in the supermarket type of uh, LED light, what we found is this little cup that's here. The old men called the maze in Kenya. They carry little pouches, usually, that carry their chew that they put under their lip. These were really good for those guys to carry the chew. They put holes in it, they hung it from their neck, and they could just put the chew right in their mouth. So Michael took this off, and he put a piece of silicone over the light. Uh, not silicone, epoxy, a two-part clear epoxy. You don't need to have the tobacco pouch in order to do this, and then people don't mess with it. So this has now been developed into something that is being made in China, um, but is, it has its own solar panel, and it comes not in this jury rig glued together template that Michael made, but he now has his own business. He's a Kenyan, and he has his own business making these lights to be able to put out, and our studies give him the advice on how far distant to put the lights and how effective it is um, <coughs> for him to be able to market. We also discovered that when we would first go and we would investigate somebody's boma after hyenas came in, we would find these holes in the boma. And we're like, you know, you guys, you have to patch the holes. And they would swear to us that they patched the holes the day before. However, what we found when we put these cameras up is these hyenas literally will take a hold of a branch in the same place. When you put these branches up, they've got thorns on them. So you have to knock some of the branches off and you shove these thorny branches in and you have to have a handhold or you get thorns in your hand. The hyenas learn to grab the branch where you held onto it and tear your branches apart. But they didn't just carry it a short distance, they would carry it like 20, 30 meters away. So when we went to investigate, we're like, you have holes in your fence, you're lying to us, you didn't patch the holes. They're like, yes, we did. Well, we caught them on camera, it's these guys. They're taking your fence apart. So you have to put your fence together with the thorns on the outside and that, that part that you hold on the inside and use other branches to push them together. So it gave us a lot of ways to advise the community on how better to protect their livestock from, livestock, from predator attacks. And, and using these long-term implications, we've also been able to develop resource materials to go to school. Um, Actually, this is Fiona. Fiona was my first education officer who wanted to go in filmmaking and using the money she made from the first couple of years of working with us, got into a school program and is now doing wildlife filmmaking. I need to change this to, to the new person who's our education officer. But Fiona was the one who began testing um, the use of these school materials in schools by doing pre-surveys and post-surveys and looking at the information that the kids were retaining. And so the, the retaining of that helped us to make sure that our materials are being used 
This book is now sitting in the office for the Curriculum Development Board of Kenya so that we can distribute this all over Kenya as a tool that people in their curriculum can use. It's got math, it's got history, it's got natural resources. So everything that they're being taught in school, you can teach it in the name of the cheetah and other predators. And so that's our curriculum book that, we've, that we're giving out to the schools. We give it as a teacher's resource guide and then as an activity book for the kids. So it gets one guide for each school and then every year they can apply to get 100 books that they can pass out to their kids for their wildlife clubs. We've also taken all of the, the conflict mitigation that we've done um, from small steps that are really cheap and easy to do for people to be able to know which predator is causing a problem, what do you do and what steps do you have to take to be able to prevent the predator from coming in um, until you actually have no more predators attacking your livestock in your enclosures. So we've developed this, this toolkit. Both of these were done in collaboration with Colorado State University. I have an affiliation with them, so I take master students that come to Kenya and do these projects. We've also been involving kids in sport. If you see the balls that are back there that, that Holly and Jessica are helping me to sell, um, for every one ball we sell, we give a ball to a school in Kenya, and we play soccer tournaments with the kids because that's what the school kids love to do in Kenya. They want to be professional soccer players. And when we do that, we have a did you know poster and we make a big deal about donating the, the balls to the school kids. In addition to the team sports that we do, we then begin doing tree planting activities and um, waste management programs with the kids and talk about how they're caretakers of the environment. So it's way more than just cheetahs. The final thing I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the National Cheetah Survey. Um, so our second National Cheetah Survey has begun. And what we've done is taken our map and divided that into the areas where there were the most gaps so that we now can continue to collect the data using the programs that we started in our two sites as the, way, the method in which to collect the data and implementing that on a range-wide scale using interviews combined with biological data and our biological data involves using detection dogs and non-invasive studies to find cheetah poop. I did not grow up thinking I wanted to study poop, but poop is really important in terms of understanding diet and genetics. Um, and again, this is the conflict mitigation toolkit that they're using to figure out who killed what in the area. Um, so what we're gonna get out of this is having a range-wide master plan for cheetah conservation. Um, we also discovered in the process of all this, I don't need to look up there, I've got it right here. Um, <laughs> we also discovered in the process of our work out there that rabies is a huge issue. There are about 2,000 people per year that die from rabies in Kenya alone. And of that, the majority of them are children under the age of 15. They get bitten by a dog that has not been vaccinated for rabies and then they don't tell their parents that they got bitten. Once the symptoms of rabies show up in a person or an animal of any kind, there's no cure for rabies. The only way to basically stop human infestation by rabies is to vaccinate dogs and cats. So we started a vaccination program in our Samburu area. There's another organization doing the same kind of program in Salama, so we just tap into them. But in Samburu, we've been able to, two years in a, in a row now, vaccinate about 1,000 dogs and cats our goal is 2,000 dogs and cats vaccinated and 200 spay and neuter for this year. So this is one of our big projects that we're doing with trying to make sure that we can help people to control rabies infestations into humans, but then it also controls those infestations into wildlife as well. Um, so, so the dogs are an important part of their life, but most of the local rural communities do not understand that rabies comes from dogs and you can prevent it. So our education campaign around that is pretty big as well. We use dogs in another way in Kenya. Um, we use dogs as detection dogs. So what we do is these dogs are trained to find the cheetah poop, and so they don't mind smelling the poop because dogs really love everything that stinks. Um, but basically the dogs find the cheetah poop. We have dog trainers that have been trained in Kenya to, to handle the dogs and teach them. We work with the Kenya Wildlife Service to get cheetah scat samples, and that's how we train the dogs to smell the poop. And then we go out into the field, and using that fecal material, we can study genetics, we can study exactly what prey base the cheetahs are preferring, and we can look at the reproductive hormones, we can look at the health and parasites of the cheetahs as well. So you learn everything about a cheetah population by their poop. 
Um, and of course, I don't touch the poop, but she does. Um, that is Noreen, who is our PhD student, who is the one that's in charge of this whole project. And she also does the, the interviews with people about the, the <coughs> their perception of cheetahs as well. Um, so this is our Scat Dog Saving Cheetahs program. We have stickers back there. We have t-shirts back there. So if you wear that and you can tell people, yes, dogs smell cheetah poop. And that's how they save cheetahs. Um, and this is Maddie and this is Warrior, who are the two initial scat dogs that we've got working out there. Um, all of the things that we do here, um, I couldn't do it without a really amazing team that I have on the ground. But also, we've made good affiliations with universities. So we get students to train those students to have the capacity to be the leaders in future conservation. We've achieved 15 master's degrees um, in the 19 years that I've been doing this work in Kenya. Obviously, the first few years, we didn't take students because we were learning so much. So it's really been in the last 10 years. 15 master's degrees, three more graduating next year, by the way. Um, 31 college internships. We've taken volunteers. If anybody's interested in volunteering, um, please come and talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you how you can go about doing that. But a lot of the importance is how many elementary and, and secondary kids that we reach. Um, so we reach the kids with the information. Um, this is Adelaide, actually, who is the new education officer, um, who is helping us to raise um, some baby cheetahs that were turned over to us by the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, so they develop a, the same kind of passion for cheetahs that I had, even if they didn't have it when they started working for us. Um, these guys are working together with um, the Peregrine Fund on poison control. So the Peregrine Fund comes and gives um, presentations, and our guys go and help in, in translating and, and working with the Peregrine Fund on these presentations about not poisoning dead animals because that kills vultures and everything else as well. Um, so working together with our collaborations with other people. I want to introduce Blake to you. Um, Blake is the survivor of everything that affects cheetahs in Kenya. Um, Blake's mother was killed by some, some pastoralist community members outside of our study area. We received a call saying that the dogs were out looking for some cubs because the mother had been killed by the community. The mother normally would have hunted on one side of the railroad tracks, and she was stuck on the other side in a Maasai community where she was killing goats and sheeps every day. And I don't blame the herder for wanting to get rid of that mother. And really, it was the development of that railway that was the reason that Blake's mother was stuck over there. So the six cubs came to us, but they had been bitten by dogs. So back to this whole vaccination campaign, about 14 days after we got the cubs, they started to get very sick. And it turned out that the cubs had contracted canine distemper. Five of the six cubs did not make it, but Blake has been our survivor and still lives today. Um, this made us really understand why we need to know the, the connectivity, why we need to work with domestic wildlife diseases, and how we don't even know how many cheetahs die from distemper out in the wild. But Blake is the one who brought that to our attention. We're now adding the distemper combination vaccinations into the rabies vaccinations. Um, and the second, she's got another companion now, um, this is actually the, the cubs when we found them after they'd been bitten by the dogs. And this is the six of them when they came into us while they were still fat and healthy and after, after their mother had been killed. Um, but basically what this is doing is letting us know that, that we kind of need to develop a cheetah center. Um, I've kind of been avoiding this because right now Kenya's cheetah population is so well connected, but lately so many have been turned into us. Little Timu is another cub that just came to us last earlier this year. Timu is now old enough that her and him and Blake are living together, um, but they're in a captive facility. They can't go back out into the wild once they've been taken from their parents at this age. But Timu, somebody found him in a marketplace in a basket that someone was trying to find a way to sell it so that it could go into the pet trade because he, he heard that you could make a lot of money. Um, and so the pet trade, the disease issues, are all things that we need to strengthen what we're doing to try to, to eliminate that from being one of the threats to cheetah populations. Um, actually, this is Blake shortly after her companions passed away, looking for other babies, and once we've been able to put her out into a nice field and she can now um, play and romp the way she should. It took a while for us to get her healthy enough so she could even go outside. We really thought we were going to lose her too, so I'm really happy that that she can now represent what we need to do to make a difference in cheetah conservation. You guys can also help make a difference. 
visiting the Living Desert and helping them to support us in the work that we do. Living Desert has supported us for six years now. There's a lot of other zoos across the country. If you don't live here year-round, look at what those other zoos do to help support conservation, not just cheetahs, but others as well. Um, bowling for Rhinos is an event. I don't know, does anybody do Bowling for Rhinos here? Do your, do your keepers do that? No, no? okay. Not yet, okay. Um, bowling for Rhinos is an event that happens at most zoos, and I know a lot of you don't live here full year round, so if you hear of that happening, I get 8% of the funds raised through a project called Bowling for Rhinos, which is a nationwide thing that is happening at most zookeeper institutions all around Kenya. Um, purchasing our calendars, our books, our cheetah balls, and our Kenya crafts, all of those crafts back there are made by the groups that we work with in Kenya as a part of our livelihood development program. And there's a story behind the recycled or the renewable resources that they use. So if there's anything you want to know about any particular project or product, those guys know the answers to most of it. I've told them so much, some of it they don't remember. But I can definitely tell you what the story is behind the different products. Um, we do also have an opportunity for traveling. Um, and we have a... Twice a year, we have a group of people that come out. They spend four days with us at each of our research sites, and then they spend five days on safari. And I believe you guys, do you, do you lead, you're doing leading safaris through Classic Escapes, right? Through Kenya as well. Um, so there are travel programs. When you travel um, and you come to see us in Kenya, it makes a small donation to our project in the field, and you get to meet some of our staff. Um, also recycling, reducing, and reusing your products at home. That makes a big difference for the environment as a whole, um, and it's very important to, to be as sustainable as we can be. And I always forget to turn these. I should put this on automatic. So these are the calendars, the books, and the balls that we have in the back. This is some of the community groups that are working to make some of these items, um, and again, the adventure safari that we have. We become the voice for the cheetah's future. The, the cheetahs and other species like the cheetah, they can't speak for themselves. So we need to be their voice. Share this information with others. If you know somebody who loves Africa or loves cheetahs, please tell them about us um, and to come and see us the next time we're in an area where, where they can come and hear us talk. Um, I saved this picture for the last because Noreen came to us in a master's project. She didn't really know what she wanted to do in life, and she is the future of cheetah conservation. She's our PhD student doing the National Cheetah Survey. Um, and, and she is the one who is going to lead cheetah conservation in Kenya in the future. And that's what I'm really the most proud of is the students and the staff um, that have, have grown up with us in our project and, and are the ones who are passionate about doing cheetah conservation. The zoos are the ones who give us the majority of our support. So like I said, support your local zoos um, in what they do for conservation worldwide. And... Yes. <laughs> um, this is my contact information if anybody wants to get in touch with me at any other time. And I'm happy to answer some questions now, but also please raid Holly and Jessica back there and help to purchase crafts from our community groups. Thank you so much.